So after all uh, the uh, different uh, scene approaches by uh, either imaging techniques or uh, by um, uh, molecular markers in either blood or uh, stool, I'm trying to uh, uh, sum uh, things up and uh, in a way give an overview uh, on uh, where we uh, stand overall in uh, early detection and uh, of course uh, I, uh, I will try to do this from the perspective of an epide uh, epidemiologist because epidemiology is probably the only subject I really understand something of. Um, okay, uh, when uh, people trained in evidence-based medicine uh, look at uh, the evidence uh, for early detection and screening, uh, they uh, usually divide the, wild, uh, the world in black and white. On the one side, there are the randomized controlled trials that give the uh, level one evidence, and then there is something like these observational studies, cohort studies, um, case control studies, uh, which are sort of second and third class stu uh, studies, giving only evidence level two or three. I think, of course, I'm biased as an epidemiologist, uh, but uh, th that this is a too simplistic view of the world and uh, that there is, uh, we have to uh, learn a lot from both randomized trials and observational studies and we have to combine the evidence uh, from both in the best possible way to get the best possible answers. Of course, uh, why is uh, there uh, some um, uh, reluctance uh, to believe epidemiological studies, uh, we have a, a number of possible biases, um, uh, including uh, confounding selection bias, information bias, uh, and specifically for screening, uh, also lead time bias and uh, length bias. But uh, uh, on the other hand, of course, the randomized trials are not free of biases uh, as well. There's also, uh, um, is, uh, there are also issues of se selection bias, uh, lead time bias, and length bias to be considered. And there's uh, something also uh, quite specific uh, to uh, the RCTs, uh, namely uh, non-adherence and uh, contamination, which are in a way uh, related to the information bias uh, we have in epidemiological studies. I'm, I'll come to, uh, back to this in more detail later. Of course, there are, uh, apart from biases, other things we have to uh, think of. Um, uh, th that's the timing, and uh, for uh, many of the randomized uh, controlled trials in colorectal cancer screening, they just take several decades, and one does not always want to wait several decades for the next answer, uh, for uh, the next questions, uh, whereas uh, in some cases uh, within um, it's possible with our epidemiological studies to answer important questions uh, within, let's say, at least a month to years. And uh, also what's important is uh, the RCTs will tell us at the end uh, the efficacy of, of some uh, screening uh, scheme under trial conditions. But uh, what we really want or need to know for practice is how effective would these uh, screening uh, schemes be in routine practice. And this is where epidemiology, I think, has a lot uh, to offer and should a lot uh, offer a lot. Uh, and there are multiple other aspects, uh, for example, like uh, screening intervals, uh, surveillance intervals, the screening modalities, um, and uh, quality aspects of screening where we uh, really need epidemiological uh, studies to uh, complete the evidence. I'll uh, illustrate uh, 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 these points uh, with the potential um, for prevention by uh, screening endoscopy. Here we are, have the following uh, situation. We have these uh, wonderful um, uh, RCTs on sigmoidoscopy that have been published in the last uh, four years uh, from uh, Norway, UK, Italy, and uh, the, the US recruitment here in the 1990s. Then they had a follow-up of the participants, uh, usually uh, somewhat more than uh, 10 years. And uh, these were published here between uh, 2009 and 2012. We still do not have uh, published results for, from a, um, any RCT on colonoscopy. Um, there has been an RCT um, initiated in northern European countries. Uh, recruitment has been done in 2009 to 2013. The main analysis will uh, be possible after 15 years of follow-up, so we expect the results uh, of this trial in 2030. Do we want to wait until 2030 uh, uh, to decide whether colonoscopy is effective or not? Um, I uh, probably am, uh, am too uh, impatient or impatient to, to do that, and I think we really have to get some answers uh, before. So uh, one uh, approach to uh, the question, what can colonoscopy um, uh, um, Tell us is um, uh, something we did in uh, this meta-analysis that was uh, recently uh, published, uh, where we uh, tried to bring together the evidence um, uh, in a systematic review and meta-analysis of all um, randomized trials, the ones we have seen here, and all 
uh, high quality um, epidemiological studies that met a certain quality uh, criteria. Overall, uh, we identified uh, 10 um, uh, such studies for uh, screening sick motoscopy and uh, six uh, studies on uh, screening colonoscopy, including um, an own uh, study from um, our center. Um, so, uh, what uh, did, uh, did this meta-analysis uh, uh, show? First of all, a short overview on the uh, SIG murderscopy trials. Um, they were conducted in these four countries. As you can see here, these are really huge trials, including tens of uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of participants. Uh, the uh, participants were uh, typically aged uh, 55 to 64 at recruitment. Uh, most of them had just one uh, flex, uh, flexible uh, SIG murderscopy at the beginning. In the US trial, there was an offer of uh, a second uh, sigmatoscopy three to five years uh, later. Uh, I would like to draw your attention on the uh, uh, last two columns here. Um, uh, one is uh, the uh, participation rates in the intervention group, um, uh, the adherence, which was uh, yeah, overall uh, quite high, but uh, some of these um, uh, had pre-selected uh, study participants who had pre uh, uh, before um, given their um, intention uh, that they would probably participate if they were asked. Um, so this was uh, mostly quite good, but uh, we did not get any information on uh, any use of endoscopy uh, in the control group from the uh, three uh, European trials. We got this information from the US trial, and uh, there you can find that almost half of them uh, had uh, either a sigmatoscopy or a colonoscopy in the screening phase. That is, uh, in such a trial, we do not compare what many people think, uh, people who got a, a sigmatoscopy and those who did not, but we compare a group uh, that was had a sigmatoscopy uh, to 86% uh, and another group that was uh, where half of them had a, a sigmatoscopy. So there's really a lot of uh, contamination um, going on. Uh, then how uh, do the results of such a uh, trial look like? Uh, these are results from uh, the UK study, a very uh, excellent study uh, and publication from Atkin et al. And uh, here you can see the co uh, cumulative uh, incidence of colorectal cancer. This is now all sites, even though a sigmatoscopy, of course, can only um, do something for the distal um, cancers. But um, uh, the patterns are uh, quite typical here. Uh, it takes uh, quite a number of years until one can see uh, an effect. And the main reason is that in the beginning, you have an apparent increase in the intervention group, this red line here, which of, is, of course, the detection of uh, preclinical uh, cancers that are already prevalent at the time of um, recruitment. But then it takes a number of years uh, until the curves cross. And as uh, you can see, uh, the effects um, are only here after um, 10, 12 years or longer. If you would do the analysis after six or seven years, you would probably say there is nothing going on, but who knows what would happen if you would have a few more years left. So um, it, these are excellent studies, but uh, they, um, uh, they may possibly not um, uh, tell us the whole uh, truth yet. So this is the uh, typical intention to screen analysis. Um, it's uh, interesting to look also at the uh, per protocol analysis, comparing those who actually went uh, to a screening, um, this red uh, group, and uh, uh, either the control group or, or those in the intervention group who didn't have uh, screening. Here um, we have uh, a somewhat uh, stronger effect uh, as uh, expected, because it sort of adjusts for the non-adherence. Um, uh, it still doesn't adjust for the uh, contamination we have uh, been talking about, but um, well, at least some of these effects are um, taken care of. Uh, then uh, these are the results for uh, uh, mortality uh, from the same study. And here, of course, you do not have this initial increase, um, uh, this apparent initial increase in the intervention group, um, uh, but uh, the curves uh, actually um, uh, di diversion from the beginning, um, and, but uh, again, uh, the result you'll get may uh, depend on the time where you do your analysis, and we still do not know uh, the uh, even longer term um, result. Okay, in our meta-analysis, uh, we uh, then uh, summarized uh, these results from the RCTs, uh, from the intention to screen analysis, um, and the per protocol analysis, which you can see here for mortality. And this is now only distal colorectal cancer, where sigmoidoscopy can have an effect. There's a 31% um, or a 47% um, a decrease in uh, incidence. Um, and for mortality, the effects are even stronger, 46% and 61% decrease. 
If you uh, then look at the observational studies, uh, uh, those uh, that met these high quality criteria, we see uh, uh, quite similar results actually um, uh, as the per protocol analysis of the RCTs for mortality and we see a um, somewhat stronger effect uh, for uh, the incidence. Uh, well, uh, the question is uh, why, uh, uh, what's the reason for these differences? It could uh, still be some uh, residual uh, confounding or bias in the observational studies, even though we only took uh, those studies that carefully controlled for confounders. Uh, a more likely explanation, in my view, is uh, uh, probably that uh, um, uh, these analyses, they were still not adjusted for contamination, uh, whereas in the observational studies, we really compare those uh, who had a, a colonoscopy, uh, uh, a sigmoidoscopy and those who did not. Um, uh, but overall, uh, the results are, 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 are quite close. So, coming to um, uh, colonoscopy, we have uh, the uh, choice of waiting until 2030 uh, to see, uh, see the results, which we did not want to do. Uh, uh, and uh, then we did uh, the meta-analysis of the observational studies we have here. And this is now for total colorectal cancer, very close to the results for the sigmoidoscopy uh, uh, for distal colorectal cancer, approximately or almost 70% uh, risk reduction for those who had a colonoscopy compared uh, to those who didn't. Okay, um, we uh, uh, try to contribute to this question uh, with an own study, our duck study that we have uh, initiated. Uh, some uh, 10 years ago um, in uh, the area here around uh, Heidelberg uh, where we try to collaborate with all clinics uh, providing primary care uh, for colorectal cancer patients. It's, uh, the study includes now almost uh, 5,000 cases and 5,000 controls. We collect very uh, detailed data by personal interviews, uh, collect the medical data uh, by a specimen and do a follow-up of uh, the patients, especially we ask in very much detail for their uh, screening or um, endoscopy histories and use this information uh, to uh, estimate uh, uh, effectiveness of colonoscopy. And here are some uh, selected uh, results of, um, that have come out of this study in the last few years. Uh, the first one showing that uh, those who had any um, a colonoscopy in the last 10 years have a, an approximately 77% lower uh, risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, if we specifically look at uh, screening colonoscopies, the risk reduction is even stronger, 91%. Um, then we try to answer uh, additional questions regarding the screening intervals. Uh, we found very, very low risks of colorectal cancer for up to 20 years um, after a negative colonoscopy, which means that uh, Yes, a, a 10 year screening intervals uh, is not uh, too long. We might even uh, prolong them. Uh, we also found relatively uh, low risk for up to 10 years, uh, even when adenomas were found uh, and uh, removed. And this is, uh, I think, important information for the definition of uh, surveillance intervals. For many, uh, 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 in many cases, we can prolong the surveillance intervals that had been one year, uh, many uh, some some years ago, uh, and then three years for uh, everybody. And uh, I think in the meantime at least for uh, those with low risk uh, adenomas, these can be prolonged to at least five years, if not uh, 10 years. And uh, uh, then we uh, try to answer other questions of quality assurance and, uh, for example, looking at the very low number of uh, interval cancers, we found that uh, they were um, attributable mostly to colonoscopy related factors, not to uh, adenoma related factors, which uh, and we can learn uh, a lot uh, from that on the quality of uh, screening a colonoscopy and what could be improved. Okay, uh, let's come to the stool tests. Um, uh, we, here we have this uh, famous old uh, Goyard based um, uh, test for blood in, in, in stool and uh, these famous studies that have been going on for many uh, years or de decades. Uh, this is the Minnesota study uh, where uh, another update was published in 2013 uh, in the New England Journal. And you can uh, see here how nicely um, uh, the curves of uh, cumulative colorectal cancer mortality uh, split uh, over time. And uh, this uh, uh, even increases the uh, effects over time. So it's another example uh, uh, that uh, this is effective, uh, but and uh, that uh, we see the results of such, or the full results of such trials, even um, uh, after decades, or um, in this case, uh, 30, 40 years uh, later. Um, Again, uh, we do not want uh, to wait so long if we have new and better tests, and this is one of the reasons uh, why uh, we have set up uh, the BLIP study, um, uh, which is uh, 
uh, a study we are conducting in cooperation with gastroenterology practices uh, also in uh, southern uh, Germany, um, uh, where we uh, um, have the target population of screening, those who uh, go to screening colonoscopy, where we collect blood samples and stool samples uh, prior to colonoscopy and prior to uh, the preparation for colonoscopy. Um, then, of course, we collect uh, all the information from uh, colonoscopy itself and these autology uh, reports and um, uh, also use uh, questionnaires to get some risk factor data uh, from uh, uh, the patients. And um, this uh, will then uh, provide us uh, with a basis for assessing the diagnostic performance of various uh, blood and stool tests in comparison with colonoscopy. We can compare, directly compare multiple uh, tests between each other. And of course, we can look at uh, the, uh, the combinations of the, uh, different tests and see uh, uh, how far we come with the combinations. And one such example um, uh, is of use, um, uh, it was published uh, last year, where we uh, just wanted to contribute to the ongoing discussion in Germany on uh, the introduction of the new immunological tests uh, for blood in uh, stool. Um, uh, we adjusted the following. Uh, here are the uh, sensitivities for um, uh, cancer, uh, um, advanced neoplasms, and any neoplasms for the old coiac based uh, tests um, in uh, uh, this sample. And then uh, we, in this case, we had uh, three uh, quantitative fits that we compared it with. And to make it really comparable, we set the positivity rate to 5%, which was the positivity rate of the Goyak test, so that everything is uh, completely comparable. And we found clear. Um, a better, uh, clearly better performance of uh, uh, the fits here, and uh, the same for specificity. Um, um, and uh, overall, uh, I think uh, if we have uh, a fixed or uh, a certain cut point, uh, a certain positivity rate, there is no question that these uh, new tests are uh, performing uh, better. Uh, then, uh, since we have this questionnaire data, we can also link uh, the performance of the tests uh, with uh, these data. And what we did in one of um, our analysis, uh, uh, we uh, uh, split up uh, the people by use of aspirin. There were approximately 20% of the participants who took aspirin for cardiovascular uh, uh, prevention. And uh, if, uh, when we looked at uh, the uh, performance of uh, the FIT uh, here uh, for um, uh, detection of, uh, this is advanced adenomas, it's not cancer, uh, advanced adenomas where we usually have uh, at best an area under the curve uh, uh, close to 0.7 or so. Among those uh, who took uh, aspirin, it's, uh, it was uh, 0.87, which is probably explained by uh, well, uh, the fact that uh, aspirin, of course, favors uh, bleeding, but it's not approved yet. And uh, to follow uh, this result, um, uh, we have uh, uh, immediately initiated uh, another study, the ASTA study, where we try to give uh, one pill of low-dose aspirin um, uh, immediately or, or the day before uh, the, uh, the FIT test and uh, to see whether this really uh, can be uh, replicated and confirmed. And this is now a randomized trial just to prove that I'm not a, uh, I have nothing against randomized trials in general, uh, but you have to uh, use them as effectively uh, as possible. Um, and uh, so some of the people will get uh, the uh, aspirin uh, and the others will get a placebo and we hope to see the results in uh, one or two years. Um, one last uh, uh, word uh, to this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, breakthrough uh, trial uh, that has been reported uh, a few weeks ago in the New England Journal. It has been mentioned several times uh, today uh, where uh, this uh, it was uh, called the multi-target DNA uh, stool test was propagated as uh, giving um, excellent uh, results in terms of sensitivity and uh, uh, actually uh, they had an internal comparison with uh, a fit in this uh, study um, and uh, the sensitivity for colorectal cancer but also ad adenomas was uh, higher here for, for uh, their test but the specificity was somewhat lower. Um, okay, so the question is uh, what is um, uh, better of course with a quantitative fit you can just uh, adjust your uh, cutoff uh, and uh, 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 what we then did, we took our, uh, the results of our uh, BLIP study uh, and where we had uh, several fits um, uh, measured uh, and we adjusted the cutoff of, of the fits to get exactly the same uh, specificity that uh, uh, this multi-target DNA stool tests had. And uh, if you uh, look then at uh, the sensitivity for these various uh, outcomes, it's essentially 
the same. So the good news is uh, this uh, is really a good test and it uh, has a good sensitivity, but the even better news is that you can get the same results at much lower costs uh, just with a simple fit. <laughs> and I think I would uh, close here with this hello from our division and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Arbor from Tel Aviv. Maybe your results are even better because those which are fit positive and nothing in the colon, did you look for any lesions in the esophagus, stomach, small bowel? Um, no, we did not have this possibility, um, but uh, I would agree uh, it, it's well possible that uh, the pos fit positives came from uh, other lesions in the uh, gastrointestinal tract and might, be, might indicate something real. So, so why do you suppose that in all of these evaluations, and I've fallen heir to it myself, we don't look at the histopathology of the lesions themselves? So we just, if we usually say adenomas or advanced adenomas, but we don't take it any further. Is it because the data wasn't available or? I think this uh, awareness of this uh, serrated uh, lesions is relatively uh, young. Um, uh, I'm a young person. Um, <laughs> and uh, relatively recent. And uh, uh, in, in the studies uh, uh, we are doing with the colonoscopists uh, in uh, private practices, mm -hmm. we just have to, uh, 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 to take what we get uh, from the pathology reports. And the, mm -hmm. uh, these are, uh, the pathology is done everywhere, and so we have the results from routine practice, and I don't think that in the early years of this study, right. this was already uh, commonly recorded. Now, for the more recent um, histology reports, we have increasingly um, more detailed information. That's great. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Uh, two questions. Thank you very much for this comparative study. My first question is, why didn't you incorporate the blood-based uh, DNR test in this comparison? And the second question is, you just mentioned low risk of c uh, colorectal cancer after 20 years. Does it mean you would like to vote uh, to change the existing recommendation of the health insurance uh, the situation in, in Germany uh, uh, when we have uh, 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 have to do the, the, the colonoscopy after 10 years when you have no... Uh, uh, well, I, I would stay, uh, uh, state it that way. Um, I think in, in Germany the big challenge is really uh, to uh, increase uh, the number of people who have had at least one colonoscopy because this the, the first one is I think uh, the most important one and, and there as you know we are still uh, uh, lagging behind other countries, especially the United States. Uh, and uh, in the first 10 years of our screening colonoscopy program, it was just around 22% of those eligible who had their colonoscopy. So I think we really have to in increase that. I don't, do not worry uh, a lot about everybody going back to another colonoscopy 10 years later, because even if they don't, I think uh, those people who didn't have something um, most of them will never get uh, any problem with uh, colorectal cancer. So um, uh, my argument would be uh, we should put all our efforts to uh, get everybody <laughs> at least uh, uh, once uh, to have it. And uh, the, your other questions, uh, we just did not collect the, uh, our blood samples in the way uh, the colleagues uh, would uh, have needed it um, to do their... Um, uh, um, yeah. It's the future. Yeah.